and um, so uh, I'd next like to uh, call on Gerard, who's uh, uh, again, um, I I'm very proud to have all these uh, supporters of the Freedom Association because we hear about MPs and MEPs, you know, being on the take and on the make. Uh, and uh, I think that the people we have uh, today are proof that they're not all like that. And yeah, I say I'm yeah, enormously yeah. proud of the quality uh, and the, the uh, and, and the convictions of uh, our MPs and MEPs. Uh, Gerard, over to you. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Simon and Rory and Deer for organising this event today. Uh, but also, uh, you know, all the people involved in the Freedom Association, Christopher Gill and all the patrons and the people that make it work. Uh, and continue with the arguments uh, that we've heard from Shane and Moore. Uh, I think they do a fantastic job, and I'm very proud that you've asked me today to speak. Mm. It's a great privilege, and, and also to be allowed to write an excellent magazine every month. Um, now, was it, um, was it uh, uh, David Cameron or Tony Hancock that said, <laughs> Magna Carta, does she mean nothing to you? Did she die in vain? <laughs> and, <laughs> I don't know whether when he was on the American talk show a few, uh, was it last year or sometime, you know, David Cameron affected not to really know what Magna Carta meant. Was it because he thought he might be castigated for actually having got some kind of education at Eton or he wanted to blend in with the vast numbers of the political class who seem not to know what it means? Um, but it's a symbol of what we've seen today here of freedom around the world. But I think also some, there's some slight misunderstandings about it. Um, it. It was not the king granting rights to the people. It was actually the people asserting their existing rights. It's said that when William the Conqueror conquered the country, he actually sent for 12 wise men to advise him what had been the laws. Actually, I'm OK. He, he asked for 12 wise men to advise him what the laws had been under Edward the Confessor because he himself was clever enough to know that he wasn't going to try and rule people outside of their existing legal system because all that he would have done was fermented rebellion. He did that in many things which were bad enough but he was wise enough to do that. And of course it's believed that William II in 1093 actually issued some kind of charter. No evidence remains for it. Again, it was the same thing. It was the king saying, I will rule you according to your existing laws and customs. And then again, Henry the Second, uh, sorry, Henry the First, before we have the, the Great Charter under Prince John. And of course, what was, we've already heard about the principles of the Charter, but it was basically, it was no taxation without consent, no imprisonment without due process of law, and that the king would govern under the law. Now, uh, as we've heard before, Prince John was actually excommunicated by the Pope for a period of time. And in order to, uh, to get that, in order to be uh, readmitted into the church and avoid the, uh, the political implications of being excommunicated, he agreed to, to pay the Pope a sum of money. And I'm told by my advisor down there that it was a thousand silver marks a year. Now I don't know how that compares to the 16 or 18 billion pounds a year that we pay <laughs> to the European Union, but I guess even with inflation it isn't as much. And of course that existed for about another 150 years until it was repealed under Richard II, who also issued uh, the law of prime manure which says that it is not legal for a British government to pay another government or state money. And in fact, when was that repealed? 1967, when it then became legal to pay another state or political organisation money, which is what we've been doing. I must get UKIP to put the reintroduction of prime manure into our next manifesto. <laughs> now, I think that the thread that runs through the story of English history is actually the development of parliamentary government from its earliest beginnings uh, until when we had... Now sometimes you mistakenly hear people say we've had democracy for a thousand years. No, we didn't. We had representative parliamentary government which developed and we've only really had democracy since about the mid to the end of the 19th century. And now it's in deep, deep crisis. And it's always been underpinned, that rule of parliamentary law, uh, sorry, the rule of parliamentary representation, underpinned by law. 
And we've got here, uh, where do it says, what does it say? This, this is to uh, commemorate the rule of law. But whose law? And what's law? You can do all kinds of things with the law. When Stalin sent millions of people to the, to the gulags and the death camps, he was perfectly legal. When the Nazis condemned people in the concentration camps, they were doing it under the law. And in fact, their defense at Nuremberg was, we were following orders. And they thought that they had a perfectly valid defense under their law. And they probably did. Because continental law is fundamentally different from English law. Under continental law, the law is usually written by a great lawgiver, whether it be Justinian or Napoleon or somebody like that, who decides what the law is going to be. And they take, as the head of state, take final responsibility for what the law says. English law is different. It's from the bottom up. Under the common law, decisions were made over long periods of time by judges setting precedent to do with the exigencies of case law that arose, which is why on the continent they remember their legal systems by the name of the great lawgivers that give them, whereas under English law the principles tend to be remembered under the names of the ne'er-do-wells and criminals and murderers that the law was actually devised to deal with. It's a completely different system, English common law to the continental system, and I think essentially if you break it down, one system is given, but the other one was taken. Under, in Nuremberg, they tried them under the common law principles, which says that everybody is responsible for their actions. And if they do something which is wrong, they are personally responsible. That was why French, uh, sorry, the, the, the English look system and the American system worked that way, and the Russians on one occasion were perfectly happy to use that system because it meant that they could condemn the Germans to death for war crimes. And I think that's a very important uh, principle to remember. Now, um, a few years ago I thought I'd like to write a little book about the uh, basis for our membership of the European Union, why I believe it's illegal and unconstitutional, and I never had the time to do it, but then my friend Pavel Stroilov entered the scene. Pavel, show your, make yourself known, because we've written a little book between us called Inglorious Revolution. Pavel is very modest, but I could not possibly have done it with his, with his, without his brilliant research. And the objective of this book is to actually show how our membership of the EU is uh, unlawful, unconstitutional, and why we have to leave. It breaks the fundamental principles of English law, which cannot be set aside. Trans sovereignty of Parliament cannot be transferred by Parliament because they don't own it. It belongs to the people. And what it does is set how, how can we regain that sovereignty and become a free country again. And we've called it Inglorious Revolution because, as you will all know, in 1688 we had the Glorious Revolution. And it's, the, it's a strangely English thing, a, a revolution in England. In France, they overturn the state, cut the head of state's head off, kill loads of people. Uh, in Russia, they do a similar thing. They kill the head of state, they kill loads of people. In England, we don't do that. We have a revolution in order to reinstate the traditions and principles that our leaders had subverted and got rid of. And I'm very proud of that. And we did another revolution. This, what happened to us in 1973, was an inglorious revolution, a despicable and contemptible revolution, when the traitor Edward Heath signed away our right to govern ourselves. And what we've seen in the last 40 years is more and more and more power acceded and given away to the European Union. And I sit there every month with Syed, and I'm sure he must be as depressed as I am when you see your country being salami, salami sliced every month with more and more and more power going to these incompetent buffoons who claim to be the rulers <laughs> of a great new European state. Sovereignty cannot be given away. It belongs to the people. The people are entitled to another revolution, a peaceful, glorious revolution, which will take back the powers that were given away and reinstate our status as an independent, self-governing nation. This is a battle about survival, 
the survival of the English state and our customs and our laws and I think there's no better rep, no better symbol, no ba better banner to fight behind and underneath than Magna Carta. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah.